Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at the resource war from Extra History. If you didn't see episode one of my reaction, the link's in the description, as well as the link to the original content. I would encourage you to watch the entire series on your own and then come back for the reactions and my additional commentary. So let's go ahead and dive into part two and see what's going on. The year is 1941. World War II is entering its third year. France has collapsed, and Great Britain is barely holding on. A last bulwark of democracy against the tide of fascism. Dictatorship rules Europe, and the sleeping giant of the United States has yet to wake. With the collapse of France in 1940, the situation in Europe becomes clear. So while this, you know, we use that phrase, waking a sleeping giant, which was attributed to Admiral Yamamoto, almost certainly didn't say it. Um, the quote is something like, I fear all we've done is awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. While he didn't say it, the sentiment is absolutely true, but it's fair to say that by 1941, late 1941, it's not like the U.S. is sitting around sleeping and waiting for World War II to happen to them. Franklin Roosevelt and his administration have been doing some things. The draft has been reinstituted. They're starting to build up the military. They're starting to build up the infrastructure that's going to be needed for this. Uh, things are happening. The ball has gotten rolling somewhat. Without resources from the U.S., all resistance to the Nazi military machine would collapse, no matter how bravely the small island nation of Britain tried to hold out. But America was opposed to war. In fact, it goes further. America was opposed to any intervention at all. In the 1930s, the U.S. had passed the Neutrality Act, which not only established that it wasn't going to get involved with foreign wars, but went further with the prevailing American isolationism of the time and declared that America wasn't going to sell arms to nations at war. President... So you have to remember that for most of U.S. history, the prevailing thought has been we'll stay out of European affairs and Europe stays out of American affairs, meaning North and South America. The Monroe Doctrine. That all changes with World War I when the U.S. gets involved. That's really our first time getting involved in, in intervention in a way that isn't immediately on our borders. Um, that wasn't thrust on us. Yeah, listen, back all the way back to Thomas Jefferson's administration, you have the war with the Barbary pirates. And during Washington and Adams' administrations, there have been concerns about getting pulled into a European war uh, that we weren't directly involved in. And of course, the War of 1812, but again, that was mostly fought in North America. President Roosevelt saw the threat that Nazi Germany posed and desperately wanted to find ways to support the British war effort, but the Neutrality Acts kept his hands tied. When Czechoslovakia fell, he lobbied Congress to renew an old provision in the Neutrality Act, called Cash and Carry, but his efforts were rebuffed. Then Poland fell, and things started to look grim. Finally, on November 5, 1939, Cash and Carry was renewed. But Cash and Carry was a limited provision. It allowed for the sale of material to Britain and France, but only if they paid in cash for the material and transported it all back to Europe themselves. No U.S. ship was to enter a war zone. At first, this worked, but as the years dragged on and France fell, Britain found itself hemorrhaging its reserves. The Battle of Britain and the campaigning in North Africa had been bleeding it dry. There simply was no more cash in the UK, and even the British fleet was being stretched thin. In 1940, Roosevelt established a policy allowing the trade of destroyers to the British in exchange for bases in British colonies. This policy was definitely pushing the limits of the Neutrality Act, but technically it wasn't violating the terms of cash and carry because the British were trading for the ships rather than buying them, and hey. So basically, when you are hamstrung by your nation's own policies and you are the executive and you see very clearly what needs to be done, you find ways to bend it as much as possible. This is what Abraham Lincoln did during the Civil War. Uh, you could argue pretty strongly that he went a little further than bending the law. Uh, but you will push and push and push and do whatever you feel needs to be done if the circumstances demand it. It's that whole attitude of it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. Hey, ships do a pretty good job of transporting themselves. So there you go. 
This deal really shows the desperation of the situation, though. Roosevelt risked a potentially illegal action because everyone, his staff, and even much of the British staff saw the capitulation of the British Empire as inevitable. In 1940, everyone thought Britain was on the ropes. Mere and think about what happens if Britain goes down, right? Everything that happens at, you know, for the United States in Europe is predicated on using Britain as the home base, going into North Africa going into Italy from North Africa, going into Normandy. All of this is heavily dependent on the British, on their Navy, on their land to be able to launch these. And uh, Britain Falls, I just I don't see a great scenario where the U.S. is able to help the way that they do. They're weeks from being taken down. And so, as a last Hail Mary, this destroyers for bases deal put U.S. bases on British colonies so that they wouldn't simply fall into Nazi hands. But fortunately, the Battle of Britain was won, and now the U.S. had to enter into more long-term thinking. It was time for Lend-Lease. This is one of the critical turning points in the Second mm -hmm. World War. It's right up there with the German invasion of the Soviet Union and the United States finally deciding to fully commit to war. Without Lend-Lease, the U.K. almost certainly would have fallen. Fascists would gain control over all of Europe, and even if the U.S. later decided to enter the war, they'd have no jumping off point for a European campaign. But Lend-Lease at last meant that the complete industrial power of the U.S. would be committed to combating the Nazi war machine. With Lend-Lease, the U.S. had finally picked a side. You see, the idea behind Lend-Lease was simple. The U.S. would give its strategic partners, and I say strategic partners because they're not allies yet, massive amounts of war material for the duration of the war. After So what's a strategic partner? It's somebody who's got the same interests and the same goals and the same values that you do, or at least that's how you see it. Uh, and if you're looking at this, you're like, okay, we're not involved as a belligerent in this conflict, but as a strategic thinker, Obviously, we have a lot more in common and our country has a lot more interest in the survival of Britain than in the victory for Nazi Germany. For which these strategic partners were supposed to give that material back. Funny thing about war material, though, not a lot of it tends to come back in the same condition you lent it out in. And the U.S. knew this. This was essentially the largest donation of war material in the history of mankind. And it wasn't just tanks and bombs. It was foodstuffs and telephone cabling. It was trucks and clothing. Heck. And this wasn't just to the UK. A lot of resources from the United States are poured into the Soviet Union as well. We talk all the time about the Soviet Union basically carrying the ball for the Allies on the Eastern Front. But despite their huge amount of manpower and resources that they have, Without that assistance from the Allies, especially the United States, they don't hold off Germany in the East. Heck, the U.S. even shipped 2,000 locomotives and 11,000 train cars over to the USSR to bolster their rail infrastructure. This was a huge portion of the U.S. economy going to cover the material cost of the war while other nations were carrying the bulk of the human cost. And the sheer size of this effort is indescribable. It helped to drag the U.S. out of the Great Depression and galvanized American production. It meant sending millions of tons overseas, shipping on a scale heretofore unimaginable during times of war. It meant giving away more goods than the entire world would have been able to produce annually a mere 75 years before. Yeah, and listen, I, I'm not here to get into the political debate of Franklin Roosevelt's domestic policies and whether they helped pull the U.S. out of the Depression or prolonged it. That's for economists and people far smarter than me to do. But it is obvious looking at this. And granted, the numbers say that the Depression was over by this point. Uh, but the speed at which the U.S. is able to pull out of the Depression and turn things into a, uh, a booming economy depends a lot on this stuff, on Lend-Lease and then later on on the war itself. But like all things, this decision wasn't as straightforward as we sometimes like to think of it. Looking back on it today, it's easy to see the results of this Herculean task and how fully America threw herself into the effort and just assume that the entire nation was unified behind this cause, that it had broad support. But democracies are, by design, messy things. And even on the issue of Lend-Lease, voting in the U.S. Congress was split almost exactly down party lines. 
But once the measure was passed, America really did embrace this decision to truly be the arsenal of democracy, to be the engine of war for the anti-fascist world. And that leads me to a particular group I'd like to talk about. A group who's too rarely remembered and celebrated. A group whose battles were rarely glorious. They never took cities or gained territory, but they're the group of Americans who risked their lives earliest and sacrificed the most. They had higher casualty percentages than any of the other American armed services during the war, and they, very arguably, saved the free world. I would like to take this moment to acknowledge the service of the Merchant Marine. These are the men and women who serve as sailors to transport goods during wartime. They served in unarmed civilian ships, hauling necessary supplies to Allied forces throughout the war. Sailing the Atlantic, every day they faced the harrowing dread of the submarine. At any moment, they might lose their lives to an unseen and invisible vessel far below the waves. They served simply as prey, unable to fight back yeah. against an enemy that might at any time strike without warning. To die asphyxiating in a steel tomb or freezing in the unforgiving waters of the Atlantic are horrors that no one would want to face. And yet these sailors faced that every day. Not. Let me show you some statistics on this. So first of all, here's a statistic that shows you the percentage of uh, deaths based on the uh, area of service. So uh, the Coast Guard lost one in 421 died during the war. In the Navy, it was one in 114. In the Army, it was one in 48. In the Marines, it was one in 34. And in the Merchant Marine, it was one in 26. Uh, so about 4% of those who served in the U.S. Merchant Marine died during the war. Something like 5,000 ships, U.S. and Allied ships, were sunk in the Atlantic over the course of the war, nearly 200 of them being actual uh, Navy warships. Uh, just massive numbers in terms of the tonnage. Something like 800 submarines are sunk in the Atlantic during the war. Uh, just We can't wrap our minds around just the sheer number of ships that were sunk and yet how small of a percentage that was of the total shipping that goes across because if you're talking 5,000 ships were lost and yet so many made it over there it's just the scale of the logistics of this war are mind-boggling for glory but simply because it was a job that needed to be done and these threats were so real and omnipresent that the Merchant Marine became one of the first uses of statistical operations research. The frequency of attacks on the Merchant Marine presented enough data for decisions to be made about the optimal size of a convoy and the escort it might require. Evidence all gathered off the backs of broken ships and drowned sailors. So you want a really good look at what this was like for a convoy going across. Uh, it's fictional. But the movie Greyhound with Tom Hanks is fantastic. Uh, it's intense, and it shows you what these folks went through just to get across the Atlantic one time. Really good. But despite all of this, many of the men and women of the Merchant Marine signed up for voyage after voyage, returning to the seas to make sure that the material of Lindley's hmm. always got through. And though the U.S. wouldn't officially enter the war for nine more months, Lend-Lease made members of the Merchant Marine some of the first U.S. citizens to give their lives for the Allied yep. cause in World War II. And in doing so, though their sacrifice is rarely celebrated, they helped change the course of history. Join us next week as we look more closely at how the lack of specific natural resources drove Axis policy, and explore how many of the synthetic products we know today came to be during the Second World War. Necessity is the mother of invention. Say it all the time. Good stuff. And to anyone watching who served in the U.S. Merchant Marine, thank you for what you do. You are not a forgotten part uh, of our armed forces. And we can see right there how vitally important they were to the war effort. So hope you enjoyed that. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And we'll be back tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.